I'm looking at the last part of the route here and as is quite common there's a long snowy section with no rocks in it this is the last bit of rock so I've got two options here I could put in a piece of protection and go for the top hoping that my rope is going to be long enough or well, the safer option is always to belay on the last little rocky buttress if you're concerned about how much rope you've got left you don't want to get halfway through a cornice and realise you've run out of rope. So I'm going to come up and have a look at this buttress and see if I can build a belay here, which then gives me loads of rope to go over the top slope and get over onto the plateau. So I've got two nuts in the belay here. The top nut's in a flared crack and I've placed it widthways. A cam might have worked quite well in there, but cams in winter can be a lot more unreliable than they are in summer because of icing in the cracks and the fact that when you pull on them, they'll just slither straight out. So I tend to carry hexes instead, which we can maybe use the ice axe just to bash through the ice and, and get them to see a little bit better. But I haven't got a hex small enough for that crack up there. So that, that sideways nut, that's gone in quite well. So I'm going to equalise the two again and then bring Joe up. Deciding where I'm going to stand, I think I'm going to go a bit lower so that I'm below the belay. And pop that in there. So normally what I do here is try and get an overhand knot there to isolate both wires. I haven't got much sling to do that with. It's going to be quite tricky. So I'm going to do something a little bit different here. I'm going to think about where I want the centralised point and tie an overhand knot, not too tight, just leave it loose initially, pop that tail in, there, and then I'm going to move the knot until, until it's centralised, so I'm getting a nice angle pull on here, so we've got sort of less than 60 degrees there, so that's great. Some people call it the butterfly knot, the pull there, I've got two wings of the butterfly, and then into there I'm going to clip a carabiner. And that creates two mini slings so they're still isolated from one another so that's great into there then put myself do that crab up and figure out where i want to stand where i'm going to put joe people talk about one-handed clovis it's not really one-handed i tend to use two but it's easier than tying lots of loops so i've got the rope clipped through i'm going to go over the top thumb down come back round to the front, thumb up, and then loop it in. And that's a lot easier than trying to make loops with your gloves. There we go, grand. So there can be quite a lot to sort out and organise here, and a little bit of prior planning can make your life a lot more bearable at the top. So if this was a, a big birdie Scottish day with strong winds and lots of snow coming around, at this point here where potentially I'm relatively more protected, I might decide to put my goggles on here rather than trying to fight with them up there on the plateau. The other thing I might decide to do if I think it's going to be really nuts up there is get my map and my compass out here, figure out where we're going to pop out and actually get the first bearing and distance sorted because down here I'm a bit protected by the quarry up there any sort of complicated task could be really tricky if it's very very windy. Once I'm happy that both of us have done that the last thing then I'm going to do is to make sure we've got a really clear understanding about what's going to happen once I get over the top because it's entirely likely that we're not going to be able to communicate. You can use all sorts of systems with tugs in things but that can get very confusing when ropes are running over edges and you're not too sure whether it was just somebody moving wanting rope or whether it was tugging. So what I tend to do is I tend to talk about the story, thinking about the story that's going to unfold and making sure that 
myself and the, my bee layer here have got an idea of how things should happen. So the first thing is I'm going to climb up and I'm going to go over the top. At that point, I'm going to demand quite a lot of rope quite quickly as I'm walking along the plateau. There's then going to be a long delay, probably 10 to 20 seconds, maybe even a little bit longer as I create a bee lay. So my bee layer will be aware, aware of that as there's no demand for rope. And they're thinking, all oh, right, OK, Sam's building a bee lay. There's then an intense demand for rope really quickly, five really quick yanks from me. Joe might try and pay that out through his belay plate, but because of the story that he's thinking of, he'll realise that that's me safe and wanting the rope to bring him up. So at that point then, he can take me off the belay plate. I'll then take all the rest of the rope in. It goes tight on his harness. And then he ne just needs to pause for about five to 10 seconds to give me enough time to pop him on the belay plate. Then when the rope goes tight and stays tight, he, he climbs up and meets me on the top. Then we get to go home for tea and medals. I suppose the, the thing with all of that is if all else fails, the last instruction I'll give is just keep paying the rope out. If you're not comfortable taking the belay plate off, just keep paying the rope out, paying the rope out until it comes tight on you and the belay plate. There's no more rope to pay out. The rope has then gone tight. It's going to stay tight. You'll be on belay climb. And that's, that, that's how we'd sort that out. So ultimately, if there's no communication or Joe gets confused, that's his complete default setting. A little bit of effort, rewarded. One's quite rounded. Looks like it's going to be this one. I'm going to clear all the snow out, make sure the sling sits nice and flat. Seems pretty good quite frozen in with what's left. Okay, so this is a really low anchor here. The boulder's a little bit rounded on that left-hand corner. I don't want to stand up, I don't want to apply any upward force to this sling at all it might increase the, the risk of it flicking over the top. So I'm going to keep it nice and low. Get my rope in there. And then come away from it a little bit. Two nice footprints down here. Give me a little bit of... And then just making sure that's in line with where Joe's going to come up. So Joe's hopefully thinking about the story now and that we've got this pause and he'll be thinking I'm building a belay. Nice big loops on my clove hitch. Push it into the carabiner. That nice and tight. I'm going to give him a holler, just in case, he might hear it. Safe Joe! So I'm thinking about how long it takes him to take me off belay. So he's been doing that all qu very quickly, all the way up the route. So the fact that I haven't heard a shout back, I, I'm assuming he can't hear me. So I'm going to try those five quick yanks now. Okay, he's taking me off. Yeah, that's great. So I just can't hear him. He can... Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Good. Climb when you're ready, Joe! 
So there's other groups to my side here that have popped out. So just making sure I'm using Joe's name. So at the top, if there's any confusion with the shouting that's going on, people are pretty clear as to who's talking to who. You wouldn't want to be off belay at the wrong moment. It can make your life quite exciting. There we go. It's a bit like a fish. A fish on the end of the rope there, feeling for what's going on. And I'm thinking about the story. So I know Joe's now taking the belay out, moving around. So I don't want to yank in this rope super, super tight at this point because he might be balancing on those rocks trying to get those wires out and I could pull him off balance. So it's just having that understanding of what each other are doing. There we go. Cool. Hey, well done. Excellent. How was that?